first, thank, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. It's been such a, an amazing uh, meeting. Um, I just wish it was in person. Um, so I'm gonna tell you about uh, some of our work um, on confidence. Um, so let me start by sort of noting the obvious, that, that confidence is really a subjective feeling, um, which has been studied um, as part of a self-monitoring process called metacognition. Um, so we would like to understand it in a quantitative way. And so first I'd like to argue that there's really two faces to confidence. Uh, the, the subjective feeling that's associated with self-reflection. And so imagine this person, um, what they must be feeling. Uh, there's thick smoke in the air, there's a gun. Um, clearly the stakes are high. Um, but this feeling of confidence or, or potentially the lack of confidence doesn't exist in a vacuum. So if this person wants to make a good decision and survive for another day, he has to carefully evaluate the evidence, the cards, um, and the stakes um, in order to place an optimal bet. Uh, and oops, there's your bet. <laughs> and this is the objective face of confidence. It's a forecast about the decision. Um, and it's objective in the sense that we can treat it as a statistical problem uh, without referencing feelings. Now, despite the similar terminology, uh, it's been unclear whether the objective statistical notion of confidence and, uh, is related to the subjective uh, feeling of confidence. Now, I'm gonna show you that they are, but, but still, um, this leaves us with a challenge that for neuroscientists studying these little critters, there's an additional issue. In the end, it appears that only introspection and self-report can provide us direct access uh, to this sense. Uh, so how can we spot it in the brain? So that's gonna be the, the, the thread uh, of my talk. Um, but before we go there, I wanna bring up this question of whether AI at the same type of metacognition. And so let me show you this video from Taiwan uh, uh, where you see this white Tesla coming and there's a person on the side that uh, goes undetected and there's of course an overturned truck and bang, uh, <clears throat> huge crash. So let, let me show you again in case you missed it. In the back, you can see the white Tesla um, and it just crashes in without, without doing anything. Now, the autopilot is not perfect, that's fine. And that's not the point, but let's see how human uh, drivers deal with this challenge. Um, and, and, and look at this car that's coming, it slows down, assesses the situation, um, and it's going to avoid it, right? Yeah. So presumably neither the Tesla nor the human driver ever encountered a situation like this. So I chose this video because um, the visual processing challenge is easy. Uh, the sensors must have detected it. I think the issue is that the autopilot was programmed um, to, to essentially not deal with uh, data that it hasn't seen. It, it ignores it. Um, so let's see uh, what a rat does. So uh, we didn't set up a highway crash, so this is just going to be a maze. Um, and this rat uh, uh, knows, the, uh, knows it well. This, this maze is going really fast. And, the yellow uh, bar was, was a novel um, scenario where the wall was removed. You could see it, it slowed down and then it sped up again uh, after some investigation. So, so I can show it to you again. Uh, so it's going really fast. Then it encounters uh, this novel never seen before opening, looks around, slows down and then leaves. So, so I think it, it really captures the essence of the problem of how animals, um, rats and human animals, uh, deal with uh, the unknown uh, compared to AI. So, so let's get to the, to the rest of the talk, uh, which is not about this behavior, um, but rather uh, an approach uh, to studying um, confidence uh, through statistics and human psychophysics to gain traction onto the problem uh, of, of confidence. And I'll tell you uh, how we do that in rats uh, and then talk about neural circuits and and, and show you some, some new circuit data as well. And in the end, if you have time, I'll, I'll mention some implications for AI. All right, so we consider confidence as a sense, an internal sense. Uh, and of course we experience it as a feeling, but, it, but it's kind of important that it's, confidence is really useful for all decision makers, right? So when making a financial investment, it's critical to have high, high confidence um, uh, if you're gonna invest your life savings in a stock. Um, but the same goes for a rat. If, um, if the situation is dangerous, uh, 
it needs to have high confidence uh, to stick around uh, and, and search for food. So in fact, all time in that, all investments, whether they're time, um, money, or effort, uh, should optimally reflect confidence. But you must first turn this nebulous notion uh, uh, of confidence into a statistical uh, uh, concept. And the answer is a, is a definition that's common in statistics. Um, the Bayesian posterior probability that a hypothesis is correct uh, given the evidence. Um, but it's been historically difficult to test for a couple of different reasons that I won't go into. Um, but one is that we need to titrate the evidence precisely. Um, and this is uh, what we did. So, so many years ago now, we assessed the relationship between the subjective self-report um, uh, and the objective statistical confidence in people. So we set up this very simple task where people had to tell us whether they heard more clicks on the left or the right. Um, and uh, we could change the balance uh, of the clicks and precisely titrate the amount of evidence. So it's standard psychophysics that you see there. And of course, in humans, we could also ask how confident they felt. Uh, we, we chose, you know, in this case, a scale of one to five, not probabilities, to get a direct measure of the experience that's, that's not unencumbered by, by probability estimation. And, and, and indeed, because we're not interested in the precise numerical answer, that's subjective. But what isn't is how you distribute your answers if you're using statistics. And, and the V in this case is, is Joshua Sanders, who was in the lab in Balash Hangya. Um, and um, to analyze these data, um, we derived a, a normative statistical theory for decision confidence. Um, and I don't have time to tell you the full story, but briefly, we could predict statistically appropriate confidence reports based on the choice behavior alone. Um, so, and then we can compare that directly to human self-report. So it involves basically measuring the perceptual noise, that sigma there, um, uh, of the psychometric function, uh, computing confidence of the probability, and then turning it back into the person's own reporting scale. So I will just show you two um, signature predictions. Um, on the left, um, what you can see is, is, uh, is the prediction that um, that's pretty intuitive, uh, that subjective, uh, confidence report should predict objective accuracy. Uh, and on the right, it's a little less intuitive that if you change contrast from sort of low signal to noise ratio to high signal to noise ratio, uh, for correct choices, confidence should go up and for error choices, it should go down. But this is personalized for this uh, person. And this is the data. Uh, and, and so just note the impressive match. And, and, and really there's no fitting involved. So there's no free parameters in this prediction. And, and all we wanna conclude from this is that the human sense of confidence uh, originates in a statistical computation. So, and it's and because our approach is really agnostic uh, to reporting scale and reporting biases. Um, and we've done this uh, for vision, for general knowledge task, and in a collaboration uh, for memory. Now, how can we do the same uh, for an animal and ask how confident they are? So, here we designed, and, and this is also several years now, a behavioral task in which we incentivize animals to use their confidence. So we started with an analogous decision task uh, that I just showed you in people. So rats here clicks uh, on the left and the right, and they have to go uh, to the choice boards uh, to tell us uh, where they heard more clicks. Um, and we use both audition and olfaction. So sometimes I'm gonna kind of seamlessly go back and forth between those sensory uh, modalities. Um, so anyhow, so the trick is that we delay rewards randomly according to a schedule and, and correct choices are, are rewarded, um, but they have to decide uh, how to invest their time uh, to maximize the overall benefit. Now for error choices, we never, uh, they never get feedback. Uh, so we can measure the time investment before they leave and restart. And for correct choices, we introduce uh, rare probe, probe trials uh, to assess their time investment. So this is sort of a, an example session. Uh, and intuitively, the right strategy uh, is to just invest more time for more confident choices. Now, uh, again, we can't really say whether the precise time investment, which is several seconds, is, is optimal. That, again, depends on the subjective valuation. But what we're going to test is how time investments are distributed uh, throughout the trial. So let me first show you a started. Um, there's two trials just to see what we're doing here. There's three ports in the center. They poke in, they got a, a sound. They made a decision, they got rewarded. And now this is gonna be an unrewarded trial. So they went into the right choice port. They're waiting, waiting, waiting. Four seconds, five seconds, 
5.87 seconds and they left. So, so this was their time investment. So that, that's what we do. And we can do this, you know, a thousand, two thousand times um, every session. Now, we can then uh, use uh, sort of the same quantitative methodology that I showed you uh, for human reports and use the psychometric function and their own uh, sort of time investment scale to, to make a predictive time investment. And this is uh, uh, the data for, for, for a rat. And you can see, well, this is the prediction, sorry, of the model for the rat. And again, there's no fits involved, but this is the data for, for that uh, individual rat. So, so again, there's, there's sort of a close match that we interpret as, as essentially the statistical origins of confidence. Now, we've done this uh, for olfaction audition um, and, and actually in a, in a collaboration with Lauren Frank's lab for memory confidence as well. All right, um, so where is confidence in the brain? And, and I'm gonna show you uh, data from orbital frontal cortex, which we believe is sort of a dedicated uh, brain circuit for confidence. And I'm gonna tell you how the framework that I just introduced can be used to study this and understand it. So we think of confidence as an internal sense. So for external senses like vision, uh, we know how to search for neurons. Uh, uh, they represent individual features uh, like visual edges or faces and, and, and in motor cortex maybe for certain facets of movements. And, and, and this approach actually works even deep in the brain in the hippocampus. Uh, you see in, in Tim stock, they represent spatial location and sequences. Um, so what do we do for confidence, right? So there's no classic playbook. Um, so first you need to search for confidence cortex, which I already gave away for you. Um, but then um, there's really two senses in which we can say that a neuron quotes for confidence um, based on our statistical definition and also based on the behavioral correlate. And it's kind of important to point out that, that historically um, uh, it's really these, um, the behavioral correlation was the main way uh, to establish the sort of the, the meaning of a cognitive variable. And I think this is a really interesting question, but this answer is really the question about the mechanism of time investment and not um, uh, what's the computation. So we'd like to use our, our computational framework to understand what are the computations needed to account for our firing rates. So, so this is the two sides, right? How you encode uh, the relevant variable and then how you use it for behavior. Um, and, and all of our recordings uh, were done uh, in this sort of lateral, ventral lateral portion of OFC that we believe is sort of key for this. And here's a single uh, neuron, plotted the same way as I, I showed for behavior in the model prediction, but now we have firing rate on the x-axis. And, um, and what's remarkable, as you can see, is that the firing rate uh, predicts accuracy. This individual neuron's firing rate predicts accuracy seconds in advance. Um, and shows all the other features of our statistical model. Uh, and this is just one neuron and over half of the OFC neurons uh, show something like this. Now, we can also see that while the rat was investing its time, uh, the single neurons firing actually predicted uh, accuracy. Um, well, they predicted the time investment itself. And again, seconds in advance, if you look at the firing rate in the first two seconds, you can see a, a very nice negative correlation. Uh, so, you know, eight, 10, 12 seconds later. So, and again, there's a, there's a large group of neurons that, that track this this way. So, so these are um, the neural correlates. If you turn off this brain region selectively with, with Mossimo, uh, and this was done by Armin Locke when he was in, in the lab, um, it impaired confidence guided time investments without changing other aspects of the behavior, the mean time investment, or choice accuracy and so on. So we showed that uh, these neurons code for a statistical quantity, um, but we also wanted to sort of find out a couple more things that are not really predicted by statistics. And again, we is, is Paul Massena at Harvard and, and, and uh, Torben Ott who just left um, to start his own lab at Bernstein. Um, so um, I'm gonna first show you that these representations uh, do not care about sensory modality, uh, they're general. Uh, they're generalized against other things too, but okay, so here's, a, here's again, a, an individual neuron for two trial types, an olfactory and auditory. So in this version of the task, we just uh, interleave the, the two trial types. And essentially all of the neurons are like this. They code for confidence for one, 
uh, modality than they could for confidence, essentially the same way in the other modality. Um, and by the way, uh, they also uh, predict another form of confidence guided behavior, uh, a learning uh, process. Um, and there's other features, they're not modulated by reward, at least a group of them are not, and so on, and distinct from different decision variables that I'm gonna get into. But we basically can conclude that orbital frontal cortex really serves as, as sort of a, a centralized representation of, of this internal sense for confidence. Now, for time's sake, uh, I, I kept showing you individual neurons, but especially in frontal cortex, uh, people often expect a mess, right? So, so here's a, a 120 neurons recorded together. In this case, I think this is a neuropixel probe. And we asked the question, is there structure in the neural population or did I just cherry pick examples um, and decode it, um, the, the confidence representation? So, so we really wanted to characterize the full representational space. So, so in this study uh, done by Junya Hirokawa um, or led by him, uh, we, we used a, a different task, a little bit different, uh, a variation where we also changed uh, the reward size across blocks because we know that OFC really cares about reward size. Uh, so it's a reward biased perceptual decision task. Uh, and I'm going to show you an individual neuron as a tuning curve um, during the anticipation period uh, after the choice and before the outcome. This is the most interesting uh, period. And critically, we could interrogate each neuron across 42 dimensions. So we can turn them into a 42 element vector and these are the right dimensions, I would argue, for OFC. Uh, not that because there's nothing else, uh, but we know from our work and others uh, that confidence, reward size, reinforcement history are all going to be important, okay? So now we have a lot of neurons uh, across these 42 dimensions. So then to make sense of this heterogeneity, uh, we developed an unsupervised clustering approach uh, based on the response profiles, and we identified different functional groups of neurons, functional types. Uh, so this is for actually a slightly different data set. So let's go back uh, to, to what we've shown before here. Uh, so confidence encoding neurons were one group. Uh, they were not modulated by reward size and so on, but there were other groups of neurons and they each quantitatively corresponded to a decision variable. So I'm not gonna go through the full argument. I'm just showing you four of these uh, key clusters, um, but this was a static view. Uh, we clustered a tuning during the anticipation period when when things were really uh, both stable and, and, and you had the most number of decision variables. So let's see what happens um, uh, during the time investment pass in a dynamic fashion. So in new work, we're extending this um, and, and this was led by uh, Torben uh, and, and Paul and joined now by Amy, who many of you know was in Mark's lab at Stanford. And uh, I'm just going to show you two interesting functional bias. Uh, so the one uh, right here, and then codes confidence in, in a negatively tuned way. So the, the, high, the firing is highest when the confidence is low uh, and the firing is mostly uh, right after the choice uh, in the beginning of the anticipation period. Um, and there's this really cool cluster um, of neurons that are ramping up. Uh, and they're ramping up during the anticipation period uh, but they ramp up for many, many seconds uh, right here. Um, and uh, they predict the choice to leave and zero is the time when the animal actually aborted the trial and left. So um, we're still in the middle of an analyzing this data, but, but it's, it's really exciting because it really reveals that sort of key aspects of the computation that we know must be going on in OFC are actually represented in distinct groups of, of neurons. Now, I plotted these using TSNI, sort of similar to what's often used um, in transcription analyses of cell types. And here's a beautiful uh, example from the Allen Brain Institute. Um, but we actually know little um, as to whether sort of the biological variety of cell types maps onto uh, the response diversity and behavior of function. So, so this has been really a key uh, puzzle for, for my lab. So separate from what, what I've shown you so far, uh, really the very first project in the lab focused on understanding this in, in the context of cortical inhibitor in neurons, uh, largely because um, the tools to target these became available a decade ago, and many of these tools actually from Stanford. So for the three major uh, genetically defined interneuron classes, we actually found 
uh, distinct computations under very specific behavioral conditions. Um, so this was nice uh, to do in the context of interneurons because we actually knew a lot about the, the sort of the types, um, uh, but it's much more difficult uh, to do for, for pyramidal cells, the principal cells of cortex, uh, because it's kind of unclear sort of how to uh, segregate them into distinct uh, types. So Sulin in the lab performed a, a truly remarkable comprehensive mapping of all the subcortical projections from rad -OFC using every single uh, possible tool. Um, so here uh, you can see these were the regions that, that, she, that she looked at, the, the dorsolateral, lateral, and ventrolateral OFC, and first did a, an enter grade mapping to identify the key target regions. And I'm gonna show you just three tidbits uh, that she found. So she used um, MAP-seq to barcode neurons and sequence them uh, using Tony Zader's approach, and then showed that single neurons uh, target um, uh, single uh, target regions. So, so here's an example of this. So these are the VTA neurons, and you can see most VTA neurons just go to VTA. There's some that also go to uh, supercalculus and some to contralateral FC, um, and some elsewhere. But the major target is just one. And this is for SC. Most of the neurons projecting to colliculus go to colliculus. By the way, it's actually a new projection that wasn't known that uh, OFC actually targets the colliculus. Um, and uh, some neurons both target SC and the VTA uh, and, there's, and some others. But there's a really one-to-one -one mapping uh, for, for a large fraction of neurons. Now, she then used a, a viral ribosome trapping uh, to sequence three major cell types uh, projecting to a striatum, Colliculus and VTA. Um, actually, uh, Ilana's lab has done something similar for MPFC. And, and um, Sulin found these to be molecularly distinct. And um, sort of, and then she used uh, a retrograde tracing approach to identify the spatial positions of these neurons. And this was kind of remarkable. Um, so three of these projections that are classically in layer 5B, uh, the VTA, the SC, and the DR, the dorsal raphe, actually for, fall into slightly different sublayers. Uh, so there's really a remarkable uh, organization of frontal cortex uh, based on projection patterns. And I'm gonna leave it at that and just show you one of these examples that we pursued, which is the projection to the striatum. Um, and and this, is, this is actually published. So we developed a, a retrograde viral approach um, to target uh, neurons uh, projecting to the striatum using a, a, a CAF2 complementation strategy and optogenetically identify these. And, and what you can see is this one neuron that that's, I find so beautiful. Um, you can see that it's increasing its firing rate after error choices when there was no reward. And this firing is sustained all the way into the next trial, which is often actually many seconds uh, delayed. We're just aligning it to, to the current trial and this is the next trial. Um, and when you look at this epoch, they're encoding the sort of integrated value. And if you look at tag neurons, which are hard to come by, uh, 18 of 24 did this, and five uh, of the other six were oppositely tuned. So the sustained firing was for correct choices. And, and to me, this really reveals a remarkable uh, correspondence between a specific function, a computation that we think has to do with a credit assignment uh, and an anatomical cell type. And what's interesting is we can also find this group of neurons uh, through clustering. So without looking at, the, at, at sort of the tag neuron, uh, we could find one group which was just cluster B uh, that essentially did the same thing. And, and in fact, um, Christina uh, Constantinople just published a paper uh, uh, with Carlos Brody um, finding the same functional uh, type uh, in OFC, RAT OFC in a different task. So, so I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled because it, it really shows that uh, there's a lot of structure uh, in these frontal regions that have not been appreciated and, and sort of I think there's gonna be a much uh, more principled way to go forward uh, to understand what's going on. So this was my last uh, data slide. Uh, we don't yet have uh, recordings uh, or we're starting to have recordings, but not a story yet for some of the other projections, but that's really what, what's driving us. So I want you to take away to sort of two main things um, from, from what I said. First is that confidence is a sense. It's an internal sense. 
I think that's able to kind of summarize different data streams uh, uh, from sensation and probably from things like memory to produce an output. And, and we have a statistical framework to understand it. So also map between humans and, and, and animals, which we're very interested in pursuing in the context of psychiatry. Um, but also it's kind of an interesting concept of, of what confidence is useful for, uh, for other things uh, beyond confidence guided time investments such as learning and so on. The second piece is of course that orbital frontal cortex contains what we believe is a dedicated circuit for this. Uh, OFC is not only doing confidence, it's doing other things, but, but one of the key things is, is really that it, it sort of, again, combines different uh, data streams. Um, so we see abstract representations that are independent of sensation and action. Um, and we're seeing cell type specific circuits. And, and, and we're very interested in, in, in then understanding, of course, the, the, the broader circuit uh, of how information gets into OFC and how it gets out in a cell type specific way. And that's, that's kind of uh, what we're after. And uh, if you allow me, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Uh, I want to end on some speculative notes that 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 um, that are maybe relevant to the to the discussion about uh, AI. So, I used to really dislike the term metacognition because it takes a difficult to define term cognition and makes it even more mysterious by adding the word meta. Um, so. Our approach until now has been largely focused on taking away the mystery and just using statistics to study it. But I've come to appreciate metacognition because it turns out that the way neural representations are arranged uh, sort of contain um, specific things that are not predicted from first principles. And, and potentially there's architectural features uh, in the rodent brain that I think are evolutionarily conserved that really um, could lead us understand metacognition sort of in a new way. And, we are pursuing this hypothesis, I call metacognitive bottleneck hypothesis, that, that posits that there's this dedicated circuit that centralizes the monitoring from all sorts of internal processes. Um, and then it's potentially, of course, introduces trade-offs. Um, and and we, we only have a you know, little bit of evidence for this, but, but it at least hints at the, the meta-ness of metacognition and something that, that I don't think uh, uh, most computer algorithms, most AI algorithms do yet. And so at the last slide, I want to leave you with this video because um, we were just beginning to study how AI algorithms can learn uh, the very same tasks that our rats do. And we're trying to do sort of comparative behavioral studies uh, and understand whether there's some architectures that already uh, have the features necessary for what we call metacognition and, and, um, and trying to if not, the, what, what are the key ingredients that are needed? Um, so with that, let me just acknowledge beyond sort of I acknowledge individual contributors, but all my lab, it's an incredible group. Uh, uh, that's been really amazing to study all these things and, and the funding agencies and some collaborators that I mentioned along the way. So thank you.